That's right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Principles of Fitness podcast. My name is Cameron Harn, and I'm excited to welcome to the show today Mr. Derek Price, the programming officer for the Institute of Motion. Now, I've had a lot of team members from IOM on the show lately, and that's because I truly believe and love what they are doing in the field of health and fitness, leading the charge for effective health coaching all around the world. Now, what is a health coach and what role do they play in the lives of people who get to work with them on a daily basis. Well, Derek is going to sit down and talk to us a little bit about that. He's going to talk to us about how the health coach looks at the individual in every aspect of their life. So we're not just looking at the physical, but we're looking at the mental, their cognitive performance. We're looking at their diet. We're looking at behavior. We're looking at habits. We're looking at their physical well-being also. And all these things play an intricate role in one's overall health and well-being. Now, I'm super excited to welcome Derek to the show, so let's go ahead and get this thing started. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Derek Price. Uh, it's, it's an awesome message, man. I, I think uh, we share a very similar passion. Um, you know, Definitely. We, uh, I know myself, I've, uh, I, I, was, I was burnt out at one point in my career, too, and uh, you know, if it wasn't like, like, as you said, for the mentors and the people that you surround yourself to help you really see how amazing it, it is, what we do and the opportunities that we get, um, to help me stay within this industry, to continue to, to, you know, rekindle my passion and drive it forward. I think there's a lot of similarities between us. Yeah, definitely, man. So could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in the fitness industry and then where you what you're doing today? Uh, yeah. I, um, you let me know if you want to, if there's anything specific that you kind of want to get into, you know, just let me know. I mean, I can do this in 30 seconds or we can expand it out. Right. So you let me know, uh, I guess starting off, I, uh, I, I originally wanted to, I was thinking about becoming a doctor because I had a passion of, of wanting to help others. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very, valued profession. And, uh, you know, I like the idea that you can make a lot of money being a doctor and all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, I think I've always had this passion of wanting to help others. If I learned something, I always wanted to share it with somebody. And I was looking into the future and I was like, I don't know if I want to be in school till I'm like 32, 33. Um, <laughs> so right. I was like, you know, being in debt and being in school for so long, I don't know if that's the right route for me. And, uh, so I was like, okay, well, what's another passion that I have? And I, I love sports. Uh, I grew up playing soccer, uh, but I also played baseball and basketball, a little bit of football. Um, and I, you know, any, any sort of game you threw in front of me, I, I definitely tried to play. Um, so I've always loved sports and I was like, well, okay, sports and medicine. How about sports medicine? What is that? <laughs> and I went, there you and go. I was like, so of course, you know, you, you start, this is back when the internet started, right? This is how long ago this was. And, uh, so okay. there was no, there was no Googling at the time, right? You're whatever the AOL search engine was at the time. And you're, you're, you're kind of perusing, looking, looking at, uh, what, what's out there. What is, what is sports medicine? Does that mean I get to be a doctor for athletes or like, well, I have no idea what this is. And I came across the national Academy of sports medicine NASM, who at the time wasn't very popular, but now they are a governing body within the fitness and health industry, certifying personal trainers and whatnot. Yeah, they're definitely. huge now. Um, and so I was like, all right, you know what, let's see what, what this is all about. Let, let's see what personal training is all about. I had a buddy of mine who, who vouched for NASM and said, Hey, you know, I got their certification. I started training, uh, people myself and I was like, okay, let's go check it out. So I, uh, I studied it. I, I still remember like the, 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 like the VHS tapes, you know, put them in and I'm watching uh, it's at the time it was Dr. Mike Clark and, uh, Lenny Parasino. They were, uh, on the video and they're foam rolling. And so if you can imagine when foam rolling first came out, you're like, what the hell is this? Why, why am I yeah. laying on this foam? And I'm like, you know, at the time I'm whatever, 22, <laughs> 23. And my body, you know, I'm 22, 23. My body is like, you know, it's at that time, I'm pretty flexible. I, you know, I could do whatever to it at that time, right? You're invincible when you're that age. And so I'm laying on this, so I'm laying on this roller. I'm like, what is this doing? You know, this hurts. Like, <laughs> what is all this about? <laughs> and, uh, it was just, it was, it was fascinating looking back. Like, it's amazing what they, what those guys did, what they brought to the industry, because it really revolutionized 
how a lot of us do our practice. Um, so yeah, fast forward, I ended up uh, moving down to San Diego and I was thinking about maybe getting my master's in kinesiology there at San Diego state. I started working at a, uh, a Bally total fitness back when they were around. I'm sounding pretty old. Um, <laughs> it's all good, yeah. man. So, uh, I started working there, you know, just, uh, a big box, uh, club chain and, you know, there's 20 other trainers on staff and you, you, you learn from all of them and you're, you're fighting for clients and you're just hustling. Right. And I, and I did that for, for many years. I decided to forego going to San Diego state because I found the, uh, the online program that was affiliated with NASM this, the, at Cal UPenn, uh, they have a master's degree in exercise science and health promotion. So I jumped on that because it was a year long. I can study from home um, and I could still work. And I was like, okay, let's do this. And, you know, I pat myself on the back now looking back on it because I hustled. I killed that environment. Sometimes when you do online education, it's not the easiest. It's very easy to procrastinate, do all your work last second and all that. It's so easy to get distracted. Totally. And oh, absolutely. I killed it. Like I, I loved every bit of it. I had some amazing instructors. I had uh, Dr. Mike Clark was one of uh, – one of my instructors, uh, Rodney Korn was, uh, one of my instructors and then be, end up becoming a, a strong mentor of mine. Uh, and it wasn't too long after getting my master's degree, I was talking with my wife and I was saying, hey, you know what? I have a master's degree and not a lot of people have a master's degree in the fitness industry. Again, this was whatever, 15 years ago. And I was like, I got to do something more than just personal train people. And I was like, I, I always loved, I love loved to teach. I love to educate. And how can I maybe do something like that with this master's degree? And literally the next day, random email out of the blue from Rodney Korn, who was working with NASM at the time. And he, he's like, you did a phenomenal job uh, in this master's program. You, you totally, you know, you totally get our, our, our methodologies. We'd love to have you on board to join our master instructor team. And that's it, incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Uh, you know. It's amazing because of uh, now, again, just looking back on it, it's amazing how many people would have, you know, just, they would have killed to be in that position. And oh, totally. Was, you just got a I random was so email. ignorant, you know, like, oh, my God, that sounds great. Cool. Awesome. But not really like saying like, <laughs> oh, my God, this is going to be like a life changing moment. And it was uh, because it allowed me to have two professions. It allowed me to have the personal trainer side. Uh, and then it also allowed me to then dive into education. And so for many years, I did both. I was I would travel on the weekends, teach uh, teach workshops and events for NASM, and then come home and I'd practice a lot of my stuff on my clients and help them get to, to their goals. And then uh, eventually, I, you know, as I was telling you earlier, I ended up kind of getting burnt out. Um, it just became a bit monotonous. And uh, burnt out on the teaching or the personal training, kind of everything. Everything about, uh, you know, okay. you, you, you always ask the question, like, am I, how, how much of an influence am I really making? Yeah, there's a few people in my life, a few of my clients, you know, I'm, I'm making an impact here and that's awesome. But I was like, I, I, I got to do more. There's, there's something more I can do. And, and I was, at, at, to be honest, at the time, you know, I was also really questioning a lot of what I had learned through the NASM principles, wondering if, is this, how so? Well, um, I guess if, if I had to be blunt about it, there is, there's the way they view movement, uh, you know, they, there's a, like an optimal position that you would put the body in to execute your exercises and they have a, a brilliant systematic model for programming, uh, their OPT model, but yeah. In order to make those things scalable. So I learned this down the road, but at the time I didn't understand it. But to make things scalable, you basically try to, for lack of a better term, and I'm sorry for using this term, but you kind of have to dumb things down. You have to simplify things to the point where if you just make it black or white for people to follow, it makes it very easy to follow. And if the goal as a business is to scale out your models and to scale out your 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 programming and your exercise uh, coaching, et cetera, it makes it really easy to say, all right, you know what we're going to do? Let's just say this is the best way and this is the way we're going to do it. And then we're going to find sciences and principles to help support that. 
And so that way it becomes really hard to refute that. And so Mm -hmm. I ended up disagreeing with a lot of how they were, uh, just a lot of, you know, how they viewed human performance and function. And I think there's definitely some great takes from it, but it, to me, it's very limiting. And so yeah, it's a great foundation for anybody who's just getting started absolutely, in the industry. Absolutely. So, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the experience and the mentors that I have there. Um, but eventually, you know, you had I had to grow because as I always as I continued to learn and grow myself, there was a lot of my beliefs that were being questioned. Um, in terms of human movement and, and performance. And so it was like, wow. I, I So you're telling me that when I squat, I don't have to keep my knees in line with my toes or keep my knees behind my, right? <laughs> it's all these little foundational things that you learned as a foundational trainer, right? So your, your beliefs get raw. Yep. And because of that, you have two options here. You can either say, you know what? I'm pretty comfortable in the way I train. I'm going to stay doing what I'm doing. Or I'm going to allow my beliefs to get rocked and I'm going to be curious about growing these new beliefs and seeing, you know, is there perhaps more truth to this ever evolving truth that I'm learning about the human body? And so I chose the latter, chose to stay curious. And uh, I saw one of my my mentor at uh, NASM had left and and helped co-found PTA Global. And so with PTA Global, it was uh, an interesting uh, dynamic that they had because they had some amazing industry leaders all come together and collaborate as one and to have Rodney Korn. And that's where I met Michelle Dalcourt from the Institute of Motion, uh, Ian O'Dwyer, Scott Hobson, Bobby Cappuccio, Mm -hmm. Richard Boyd. Uh, I met uh, Anthony Carey um, there. I met so many influencers within the industry. And I was like, listen, if I'm going to grow, it would probably behoove me to surround myself with individuals that are just very brilliant at what they do. And I can, you know, for lack of a better term, I can steal from them, meaning that they all have amazing ideas. And I want to take a little bit of everybody if I can, and then just make it my own. Definitely. You guys got the dream team. That's what it was, right? It was definitely a dream team at the time. So I was definitely first to say, okay, you know what? I want to be a part of this. And I uh, was lucky enough to go through their process and, and join their faculty. So as I continued down this education journey with Michelle Dalcourt, immediately joined up with Viper because that was around the same time that Viper was created and then introduced to market. So I joined the master trainer team with with uh, with him. And then you know, fast forward a couple of years from there, uh, Michelle approaches me and he's like, "Hey, listen, I'm working on I'm working on this project, and it's called the Institute of Motion." And, you know, I got you and I got Johnny and DV I'm talking with Maddie Trescott, Nick Luciano, uh, people call and I'm really interested in just taking a strong look at movement and providing solutions to help people move better, uh, as well as to help people perform better. At least that was the kind of a, a, the initial stages of the Institute of Motion. And I was like, well, I, I want to keep geeking out with you, man. So it's it's an honor. It's it's an absolute honor that you would ask me of all people because he knows so many people within the industry uh, to to join his team, and so I, I just couldn't say no. Um, so upon joining, why do you think he asked you? That's a good question. Man. I ask myself every day. Uh, no, I think um, <laughs> <laughs> it, I I mean that's that. There's a lot of self reflection in that question. I would say that like anybody in any organization, you're going to bring unique skill sets. Um, you're going to, you're going to yeah. bring, uh, you're going to bring an ethos about you and a value system that can be shared by everybody else. And so being the leader that he is, that's what he did. He looked at everybody that he wanted to bring on this team and we all share a similar passion, but we all provide something unique to the team, which creates a very unique dynamic. Um, and so for me, I think it's the, really the, the organizational skills that I have, um, the, the ability to be able to grasp these concepts and then to try to simplify them to make it easier for people to digest. Along with, I think if I could speak for everybody on my team, um, we also kind of, we also bring 
a humble approach to to what we do as well. Meaning that, listen, we don't know everything, but we're damn curious about a lot of things. And as we geek out, as we go down these rabbit holes on various subjects, and we learn more and more, then you know, for us, it's like, okay, let's create some solutions off of this, and then let's go do these. Let's go try this out and see if we can, you know, take our understanding of, of human movement, of human health, and how can we make a dent in our society? Because uh, we're now we've shifted gears. Now we're beyond the Institute of Motion now, where a lot of our focus and attention really is on maximizing and optimizing one's health, where movement's definitely a big part of that equation. And that's definitely our expertise. But it's become such an interesting mm-hmm. narrative to take a look at looking at look how do, how do I enhance health versus, you know, my entire existence in this career has been fitness. And we've always kind of assumed that fitness equals health. But as we took a s- step back and we looked at this entire picture, we started realizing, you know what? Fitness definitely does not equal health. In fact, a lot of what fitness is what fitness is doing now, it's really for performance and aesthetic gains, but oftentimes it's not sustainable for long-term health. And so to, no, to us, we were like, okay, well, there's a void here. And uh, we, need, we need to fill this void to, to help people use fitness for health gains as opposed to just simply performance or aesthetic gains. So it's been, uh, it's been awesome now because that's kind of where we're at today. Uh, that's the question we're constantly asking ourselves is, you know, looking at the sciences and then trying to provide solutions around how do we help people optimize health with a, with a strong influence of movement, but then we're also starting to dabble into the other necessaries, right? The, the nutritional aspect, the sleep aspect, and other behaviors that we need to engage in outside of the four walls of a gym to help people find uh, better health in their life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was what, that's what was so incredible about attending the IOM summit last month. And I mean, I went up to Michelle after, or like, it was probably after he talked on the first day. And I'm like, this is just unbelievable. I mean, it's everything that everybody has been talking about condensed into what the Institute of Motion is trying to do for the rest of the world. I mean, I was like a kid in a candy store that whole weekend, DP. I, I can't even tell you. It was crazy. Uh, we, we, we all were. Um, thanks for your kind words. We, I know, for the, speaking for the team, we were all just super excited to... Because we all learn from each other all the time, right? And so when we put these summits together, yeah. you know, we get to hear Ryan speak, Bobby speak. We brought in Brandon Marcello to speak. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard Michelle speak. And then, you know, you still... You always take something home, right? Uh, so... I can echo your thoughts on being a kid, a kid in a candy store because it definitely feels that way. Yeah, and we focus so much on just exercise. You know, I see the industry is evolving. It's taken some time, but it's evolving. There's you're a part of very few leaders who are guiding this charge towards the evolution of the health coach, and that's something that I want to touch on a little bit here because I know in the IOM app. You guys talk about the the role of the health coach. Can you talk a little bit a little bit about those principles? Sure. Um, so for us, the health coach is really it's it's any health professional that lives more on the prevention side of the healthcare continuum. So if you think of a continuum, where on one end you have our current healthcare model, which is really the sick care model, right? It's like you get sick, you get injured, then you go and work on. Uh, recovery and regeneration from whatever disease or ailment that you're suffering from. And on the other end of the continuum, you would have the prevention side, which is, you know what, maybe if I engage in a more proactive process in my day to day, I can stave off a lot of the major diseases uh, and potential injury that tends to occur in day to day life. And you look at many chronic diseases, you'll see in the literature that most chronic diseases are behavior related. And if that's the case, then the solution is changing one's behavior. And so a health coach is somebody that lives on the prevention side, and they are providing solutions for individuals to have a more proactive approach to their own health, meaning that they are engaging in self-care strategies on a daily basis that will help them stave off a lot of these uh, issues that, that we tend to see in a lot of our first world countries 
uh, throughout the world. Um, so who, what type of professional is that? Well, you're talking about your, obviously your personal trainers, your massage therapists, your chiros, your nutritionists, uh, acupuncturists, any, any of these type of, uh, practitioners that live well on the prevention side, they all are candidates to being a health coach. And it helps them transcend the specialty that they provide. So a personal trainer specializes in exercise. But as we talked about, not all exercise necessarily equals health. So they would need a, an onboarding strategy and they would need solutions to provide to somebody that would allow them to engage in healthier behaviors at home. Personal training does not teach you that. Personal training teaches you how no. to select, coach, exercise, and design programs. but after the four walls of the gym, there, there is no, how do I coach somebody? So that's where the personal trainer can then put on their health coach hat and say, okay, here's how I can help you from a health coach's perspective to help you engage in these daily behaviors. And so the same thing can be said for the massage therapist, same thing can be said for a Cairo, et cetera. I think it takes a lot. And you and I had talked about this at the, uh, the summit and it takes a lot of active listening skills to be an effective health coach. And I think that you're somebody who is just an incredible active listener. I mean, you and I were talking a little bit and I'm telling you how, okay, you know, I want to work on these recovery modalities. However, I'm having you know difficulty with sleeping and I'm not performing at the level that I'd want to be performing at. But you, you listen to what I said, you're like, Hey, you know, you could do meditation or like even just finding a quiet place to just kind of rest for a few minutes and for me, I was like, oh, wait, okay, I, I didn't really think about that. You know, how can other coaches train themselves to be better active listeners to put on that health coach hat and maybe direct their clients into better self-care modalities so that they can to improve or help prevent some of these diseases and stuff from happening to them? With, uh, I mean, with, with inherent with coaching, uh, I think it, if, if to, to take a step back just from the active listening part and to recognize kind of our role when we're working either with a group or with a person one on one is to recognize as the coach, I'm not there to tell you what to do. Right. I, I'm, I'm mm, there yeah. to, to be your guide. I'm there to be your assistant. I'm going to be by your side. And I always kind of map it out to as if we were about to climb a mountain and I'm the Sherpa that knows I've been up and down this mountain a hundred million times. And so I know that to go up that mountain for you, there's going to be a bunch of different ways in which we can tackle it. Now, because there's many options, what I want to do is make sure that I'm going to choose the safest and most effective route for you. But within that framework, I'm going to still let you govern how you're going to get there. And I'm just going to make sure that the path that you that you choose is going to remain safe as you do so. I'll help you overcome some obstacles and potential obstacles that I might know come along the way. But at the same time, I'm going to allow you to make mistakes to help you learn from those mistakes. So that way you will learn the process of how to navigate this particular mountain. So in order for that to happen, I have to actively listen to what you have to say because I need to understand inherently your belief systems, your values. And based off of that, I have to, I have to then govern your experience based off of those beliefs. So, for example, if we talk about, let's say, somebody who, uh, who smokes, right? And I can tell them, okay, okay you, you, you want to you wanna lose weight, you want to quit smoking. Okay, fantastic. That, that sounds like an awesome plan. Um, but let's say right now you're not willing to give up smoking, but let's focus on the weight loss instead. Now I could say if as a health coach, well, listen, you know, uh, smoking is the worst thing that you can do in your life. You need to stop smoking in order to lose weight. In fact, smoking might even be contributing to your disease, blah, 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 blah. And that sort of approach is more of a, what they call a sage on the stage as if I can quote Bobby Capuccio, who then he stole that, I think from Roy Sugarman. And yeah. what that means is, you know, you're telling somebody what to do. And oftentimes when we take that approach as a coach, especially if there's little rapport or trust between coach and client, 
there's going to be very little change or adherence to any sort of behaviors that would augment somebody towards their goal. And so recognizing that, if I actively listen to you, and I understand that you have various circumstances going on with you, what I can do is I could try to use that to our advantage to help you take at least a step forward in the right direction. So an example here, I have a I have I had a client. I no longer train anymore, but I had a I had a client who, because I traveled oftentimes for for these educational events, I'd have to help my clients engage in regular activity while I was gone, sometimes for a week or even a month. And so, one of my clients who's looking to lose weight was having trouble just doing anything on her own. So I said, "Hey Betsy, listen. Here's what I need you to do." I need you to engage in regular physical activity, and know, and I know you want to do that. So let me ask you this. Here are three options for you. Do any of these options ring a bell for you? So right then and there, I'm not telling her what to do, but I'm providing an, an option as to what she can engage in. And so one of yeah. the options was you're going to get up every morning and you're going to go for a walk. Another option is you're going to schedule a workout with a colleague of mine, and you're going to work out with, with uh, her uh, three times a week. Uh, or the other option is, um, I don't even remember what the other option is, but she chose, she chose getting up to, to go for a walk every single morning. It's like, fantastic. Now, why do you think this is going to help you? Now, obviously, I can tell her why it's going to help her. Right? I can talk about all about the benefits of regular daily physical activity. But I asked her why she thought it would help her and then her story was well you know i obviously i've been you know i've known her for many years she's like i've been overweight since i've known you i've been overweight for the last 30 years and normally i start my day almost in a depression and oh, man. as i as i start my day it would really help me out as if i broke my regular habit of just staying in bed and hiding from the world. And I said, Oh, that's, that's amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing that. First of all. So it sounds like though, getting out of bed is going to be a bit of a, a struggle. She's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough every single morning. So with that being said, I'm not going to be there for you, Betsy, like next to you, right. To get you out of bed. So how are you going to get to bed at, 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 uh, on your own? And she's, she's like, yeah, you know, you're right. That's going to be a tough problem. I'm not sure how to solve for that. And so this kind of approach here where I'm not really telling her how to do, go about doing her business, but at least we're having a discussion where we're going back and forth to, to set this framework, this starts to then say, okay, I'm here with you, even if I'm gone. And we're going we're gonna to problem solve this. Right. That's what's going on with between me and her. And our trust and rapport starts to become stronger to the point where now she almost doesn't want to let me down. Right. If I'm not in town, she doesn't she's yeah. going to start to have this like, you know what, I, I really trust this individual, you know, letting this person down. That's going to be a motivator. So there's one motivator to her getting up in the morning. Now, I know she loves her dog. Uh, her dog name. His name is Chase, this cute little white fluffy guy. And I said, how important is Chase health to you? And she's like, he's my world, right? Uh, he's a, he, he acts as a service dog for her and her husband um, to help them battle uh, some of their issues uh, as well as to, mm -hmm. to provide them the, the, the love that, that, that dogs provide. And uh, I said, okay, fantastic. So would it be important then if Che walked with you? And that it's actually necessary for his health that he gets a walk in. He's like, yeah, absolutely. So, okay, done. So now you have a walking buddy, you have your dog. And then you, and you said to me, you don't want to let me down. So there's two, let's make it even stronger. Cause the more rewards that we add to this new habit, the, sh the more, the stronger opportunity we have of formulating a habit, the formulating this new behavior that will become automated as we engage in it on a regular basis. So I said, Betsy, do you like breakfast? I like breakfast. Do you like breakfast? She's like, I love breakfast. I'm like, what's your favorite food for breakfast? She's like, pancakes. I'm like, pancakes? Me too. Have you ever been to Snooze in San Diego? <laughs> oh, my God. They're amazing pancakes. 
But it's like, how about this? Is there a breakfast spot close by to you that you might be able to walk and get yourself some pancakes? And she's like, as a matter of fact, there is. There is one. And she, you know, we, we brought it up on her Google Maps and then found out that it was about 1.2 miles away. I'm like, that's awesome. It's 1.2 miles away. So if you walk there and you walk back, that's about two and a half miles of you walking every single morning. That's a big uptake in your physical activity on a daily basis. And, she, right? and oh, yeah, she's like, huge. well, but, but wouldn't the pancakes be self-defeating for my weight loss goals? I'm like, you know what? I'm glad that you recognize that. But you know what's most important for you right now is to engage in daily walks. That's the most important thing. So if that means we do a little, hey, let's eat some pancakes as a reward, as a little treat to do so, we're going to do that. And that's okay. So something that, like a, a new hashtag that I've been recently using is the idea of, it's called hashtag let them smoke. Whereas, yeah, you know what? Smokers know that smoking is bad for them. Betsy knows that eating pancakes is not good for her uh, weight loss goals. But if she already recognized that that's an issue, you know what's going to happen when she starts to engage in regular physical activity? She starts to walk all the time and she starts to gain some of the benefits of walking. There's going to come a time... She's gonna it's exactly. It. She's going to say, you know what? I don't need to order this as my reward because I'm already getting so much reward around this walk that instead, uh, just having a coffee and a light breakfast is all I need. And in fact, another reward that we didn't foresee was that she became very social at the local cafe. And so she started making friends and she would walk and then they would play board games or cards or just chat. So then it became a huge socialization for her as well that added on top of this. So guess what happened to her pancake eating? That immediately went away after a week or two. And so, and then she started to value more and more her walk more than her eating, which talk about a transformation, right? Cause forever she's eaten to combat the men- mental illness that she's been suffering from. And so now she's well, not only that, she had something to look forward to in the morning and she was so depressed to even wake up and now she has something to look forward to the first thing when she gets up in the morning to go see her friends at the pancake That's shop. That's exactly it. And in the initial stages of this habit formation, she'd text me every morning where, and sometimes the text would be a video text or it'd just be a picture of her uh, and, and or a picture of her and Che walking. And that's all it was required because all she needed from me was a little pat on the back, a little thumbs up, a little like, I'm so proud of you. Keep up the great work. I'm, I'm so happy that you're starting your day and you've already started my day because I'm hearing from you right now, knowing that you've got your, your walk in and you're finding success in all this. Um, now, habit formation isn't that easy for everybody, but it does start with this process of active listening, figuring out a person's beliefs and their value systems, and then mapping strategies to those beliefs and to those values, because if even if the value or the belief maybe goes against what 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 a person really wants, developing rapport and trust is the first place to start to helping become to, and on becoming somebody's coach. If that makes sense. Yeah. No. Absolutely. A couple things that I want to touch on here: how to establish that rapport and trust. How did you go about presenting this conversation to her? Did you, was it during a session? Did you like, go like, hey, Betsy, let's go and uh, grab some coffee? Or was this uh, in the gym over the phone? How did you go about just sitting her down and letting her know that you are her guide by the side? Uh, great question. So my, my, uh, my profession at that time was personal trainer and health coach. And my sessions were a good 45 minutes of personal training. And then the last 15 okay. minutes of all my sessions was all about health coaching, it was all about, you know, making sure people were engaging in behaviors or uh, mind mapping out, uh, you know, procedures and solutions that people would be working on on a regular basis. So I always would say 15 minutes to then say, OK, listen, you, you got to get to where you want to be no matter what your goal is. It goes well beyond the four walls. It goes, it goes well beyond the one hour that I get to see with you or the two hours a week that I get to see with you in this 168 hour week that we get to experience. So if you're really looking to change, we have to do something on the regular basis. So are you willing and able to work on 
one behavior, one strategy, and I'll work on that with you on a daily basis that you're doing beyond our sessions here. So the first thing I always do is I always ask that permission and see if they're willing to do that. Because I have to get a confirmation that, yes, I am willing to go on this journey with you. So that first step of, of gaining permission and for that person to, to ident- self-identify, yet, yeah, I'm saying yes to this person. That means I'm in. I better, I better start to adhering to whatever it is that we're about to do, right? Uh, so that's the first step. Yeah. And then the next step is then to start figuring out, okay, so there's so many behaviors that we can, that we can tweak, that we can modify, or that we can add to our daily day to day. So for you, what do you think is most important? And that person is going to provide an answer. Some people they're like, I don't know. You're the expert. Make fantastic. You're right. I am (laughs) the expert. So let's do this. Here's three options for you. One's about sleep. One's about nutrition. One's about movement. Which one of these do you feel that you can change easily? is an easy win for you that you're not doing right now, but with a little bit of coaching, you can start doing on a regular basis. And guess what that person is going to do? They're going to select one. They have to. A, uh, a side story to this that, that might resonate with a lot of parents out there. Oftentimes we tell our kids, you know, you got to eat your vegetables at the table, right? And so, of course, what does a kid do yeah. when you tell them what to do? Like, no, I don't want to. I don't want to eat the vegetables. And so when you tell the kid what to do and you force feed them and you try to, they're going to fight, they're going to, you know, they're going to try to hide the food underneath the table or in the napkin and throw it away sneakily. Uh, or, or we just sit oh. at the table for two hours and there's still the same <laughs> exactly amount of food there. It, right. So instead of having this fight, which is essentially what happens between coach and client too, is how about instead, before we make dinner, when else if I provided an option for the child and said, okay, hey, tonight, guess what we're making? We're making, I don't know, whatever, mac and cheese. And you say, with mac and cheese, guess what I have? Guess what we're going to have with it? We're, you're going to have, it's your choice. You get to pick. How about that? You get to pick peas, broccoli, or spinach, right? Three greens. Peas, broccoli, or spinach. What sounds good with your mac and cheese today? They're going to pick one, Right. And if they don't pick one, then you say, well, what's one that you're willing to do? It has to be green, right? And it's this empowerment that we're providing somebody, this autonomy, allowing them to make selections on their day-to-day choices, uh, on their day-to-day habits and behaviors, um, is very powerful for behavior change. So we would take this same idea uh, and we would apply it. I apply it to to my clients and then saying, listen, we know you gotta you gotta you gotta get moving, you gotta do all these different things. What is it that you're willing and wanting to do right now? What is it that you think that you can do right now? And then based off of that, we then get into then formulating and and uh, creating habits um, around this particular behavior. Well, it also gives them control of their environment because I, I feel that oftentimes people want to maintain as much control of their environment as humanly possible because we're bombarded with different stressors, environmental changes. I mean, there's things that can happen all the time that take away our control. But if you as a health coach can sit down with somebody and allow them to conjure up the answers themselves, then they feel they have more control over their environment and decision-making when it comes to formulating new habits. I agree with that 100%. 100% Cam. And then I would go on, on top of that and saying oftentimes people's environments often manifest into these particular disruptors or behaviors that don't allow somebody to reach their goal. And if we can change that person's environment first, then by default, their behaviors are going to have to change. So if let's say they pick nutrition, well, one of the first things that we have that we'll provide to them is a, is a kind of a checklist and saying, hey, here's a checklist of environmental tweaks that you can make at home. And if you make these little tweaks at home, it will create an environment for you not to be putting, you know, making bad choices about your nutrition. So for example, if you removed the, the ice cream that you always have in your freezer, if that was not allowed in your house and not allowed in your freezer and we got rid of it and we go, went and donated it to somebody who really would want it or enjoy it, 
i.e. me. To kids who need so, well, ice I, cream. I was, I was saying to me, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, no, just yeah, drop I'll, I'm going to take this from you. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so, my, of course, my freezer is full of uh, ice cream. <laughs> because I love ice cream. Uh, but if we change their <laughs> environment, then they won't be able to go and reach for that haagen at night, right, as their crutch or as yeah. what they as their habit that they've created after dinner they almost they have to have something so what we can do instead is replace that ice cream with something else and it could be something sweet it could be a little lollipop or something like that uh but obviously something that would be a much better choice than ice cream which is as we know it's uh, you know full of ingredients and and calories and fat and sugars etc that a person doesn't need after already eating a meal um so it, it's not about just sometimes fully removing that person's behavior of eating a dessert. Sometimes it might be just replacing it with something that is less egregious towards them getting to their goal. And that way their behavior change doesn't have to be this uh, kind of cold turkey cutting, cutting something away completely. Yeah. And then they don't feel like they're, and again, they feel like they have some sort of control that you're not completely taking everything away from them. Because I've had clients where I've sat down, done a, you know, let's say new client intake form. We're going over everything. And, you know, there's that. And this is actually a good topic to talk about is uh, non-negotiables. Do you go over non-negotiables with them? Something that, you know, they have to have that you're just going to allow them to keep and not take away. Because I remember when I tried to sit down and talk to one client and uh, he said he had to have this, he had to have this one thing every morning. It's like, I have to have it. It was just like a cold, sweet beverage in the morning. And I'm like, well, you know, it would be more, it would be more beneficial to your health if you had right. water. And I, just, I remember looking at him. I remember the look <laughs> in his face as if when, when I told him, like, you need to take this away. And, he, and it was just like, it was like I asked him to take the world away. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. And I went, whoa. And there was a lot of resistance toward it. And I went, well, I think I could have gone about that a little bit differently are there do you talk to clients about non-negotiables yeah or anything? It's, uh, i mean i've made that mistake a million times and that's where having a, a bit of a background in neuroscience and and brain biology really helps because when you when you give that when that person really doesn't want to give something up right that's ingrained into their value system right they cherish whatever that is and so when you when you tell them to just yeah. call like fully replace that and they're not willing to do that that's where you're going to start to trigger uh, what's called the limbic system of, of, the, of the brain, which is the very emotional centers of the brain. And oftentimes when the emotional centers of the brain become triggered, the rational centers of the brain, for lack of a better term, they shut off and it becomes really challenging to see what's rational. Like no duh to us if we're not emotionally invested in this, we can recognize that, yes, you having that sweet beverage every day is probably putting it's probably helping you pack on weight as opposed to taking it off. So you, that that's, that's, it, it's super rational that you would just remove that from your day to day. However, that person's emotionally invested in that. And so that's what active listening really helps is it lets us recognize that person's emotional state at that time. And then say, there's going to be things that we can't not necessarily remove right now. Right. So if that person was adamant on saying, hey, listen, there's something that I do every morning or night or something that I eat every day, whatever. And I need to do that. I'm like, absolutely do it. That's fine. I had a client that uh, would not give up smoking. And I said, that's fine. After we work out, if you want to go for a smoke afterwards, that's awesome. You know, what's really important right now that you're actually working out on a daily basis when before you were not exercising at all. So to me, you're light years ahead right now, exercising on a day to day and smoking than you were not exercising and still smoking that makes sense so hashtag hashtag let let them smoke. smoke so if we can allow these individuals to go ahead and, and even if it's a disruptor right it's a it's a behavior that is disrupting them from achieving their goals that is okay especially at start because if i aggregate around this one quote unquote bad habit if i help somebody engage in eight different habits over the course of a few months. These eight new habits will eventually do what to that bad habit? 
It will help that person change their beliefs and their values around that habit. They will no longer value that habit as much as they did before. And their priorities change. And then eventually that's where they're going to end up making that decision of, you know what, I don't need that sugary drink anymore. I'm willing to replace it now. So oftentimes we want to confront yeah. that person right up, right, up, right up front. And instead, I would recommend you work around that and then let all these other behaviors eventually change the, imper- the person's value system to where they no longer even value that original bad behavior. Now, this is interesting, too, because I mean, I feel like this is a topic, especially with behavior change, that we can go on for like hours and hours. I mean, it, it's it's something that everybody needs to understand, but it, it's so difficult too, you know, to, to know how to listen, to know how to guide people in the, the appropriate way so that they feel like they're in control. I feel that because I've had clients um, and the one that I was talking about, he has uh, he has kids, he has a family. So for people like that, they feel like they're always mm. giving. And that that one thing to them is that one reward that they feel that they can have for themselves. That's their one selfish, let's say, vice. And I mean, do you go about it the same way to encourage them to make these behavior changes? And then eventually, once they've had all these other changes in their life, then that like, then they realize that, uh, what am I trying to say? They realize that they're, what they used to hold valued, uh, valuable to them is no longer as valuable. Does that make any sense? Um, so if I hear you right, um, if, okay, so, if, if, so the person's a giver and as a, as a, and Total they giver. do value one treat for themselves, whatever that treat is, whether it's, uh, food related or social related, whatever, right. They, they, they treat themselves to something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would still follow the, the, the let them smoke mentality. I'm like, fine. That's, if that's your vice, cool. You're a human being. You're allowed to have vices. Uh, the key thing is what yeah. are you doing around this vice? How many different ways can we aggregate other behaviors around this vice? So that way the impact that the vice has on you is minimal. And if, I like and that. the more that's great. you're willing to try out other behaviors to not replace whatever your vice is, but to just engage in other new behaviors, I'm going to, I'm going to say that there's a great chance of you actually then self-reflecting, looking at your vice going, you know what, I don't need that drink anymore. Or, you know what, I don't need to be binge eating uh, with my friends on a Friday night after work every single Friday. You know, maybe I should start cutting back on that where I, I, I value the socialization aspect. So maybe what I do is instead of every single Friday, maybe it's an every other Friday. If you do that, that's two Fridays that you're not binge eating. That's you're saving yourself a ton of extra food that you'd be putting in your belly just from doing that. And then money money. on top that you can spend on me, the health coach. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, it's, uh, I'm not a fan of trying to just, you know, to tell people to change what they do on the day to day. All of us have plenty of vices that, you know what, if we got rid of them, yes, our lives would be, let's say more productive or better for, for whatever uh, way, for whatever way we want to measure that. However, I think uh, when we, when people have such concrete goals, such as trying to lose weight or perform better in sport or at work, um, I think what we can do is essentially squash that person's values um, around their current behavior by just uplifting them and then helping them engage in other behaviors and just having them focus on all that as opposed to trying to beat down the really thick wall of changing that one vice that we you know that we're finding to be a, a strong disruptor in their life if that makes sense. So go, so no, go, totally. go around the wall yeah. as opposed to try to beat it down. Amen to that, man. And it'll be a much more effective way and it'll just help build rapport, trust. And let's say a year or two down the road, they're just preaching your name to the heavens. Well, it's, at that uh, point. And you know what's funny about it? It's they're both a very long approach. Like, let's be honest. It's a, both approaches are incredibly long to beat down the wall is a very long process. And then to walk all the way around the wall is also a very long process but the journey itself is different because the beat down that wall is mentally 
excruciating um, to the point where most of us will not have enough willpower on a, on a regular basis to eventually break down the wall and be able to see through. That's not going to happen for the majority of people. Whereas the other way, going around the wall, there are many events and new behaviors that you engage in that these are all successes, that when you add a bunch of successes up over time, it makes the journey look like not so bad. And at the same time, it completely uplifted you and showed you and empowered you of what you can accomplish. And so to me, I think if I were to paint that picture for them, it helps them show that, you know, it sets the expectation that this is a long process, but it's a more fruitful process if we decide to walk around this wall that's in our way, as opposed to try to knock it down with just our fists. You know, Derek, the, the, the picture that you just painted for me made me so excited to go walk around the wall. Like there, there's nothing that I'm like facing right now, but I'm like, yeah, you know what? Let's go find a new journey. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the goal's on the other side of this wall. But uh, and so some people, that wall is the Great Wall of China, right? So it's going to take a long time to get there. But again, that's what the guide does. The guide sets the expectation of the journey at hand, and it shows you the options. The guide says, "There's a, you can go through this wall if you want, but your fists are going to get plenty bloody. Your body's going to get beat up doing this, let alone the mental strain of trying to just break down this wall. Or we can go to this other path. It's going to be a long way no matter what. Until, let's say, uh, Tesla decides to invent something to help propel you over the wall, uh, and then, then uh, <laughs> that, that would be a great guide for you at that point. But for, for now, this is what we know is probably the, the most effective solution for behavior change. Hey, let's go walk around the wall and enjoy is that a, the journey. Is that another that hashtag, awesome. walk around the wall? I, I think we'll make that a new hashtag, walk around the wall. Love it. Derek, um, a couple more questions just to wrap up here. Uh, all this information is incredible. I mean, the behavior change is such a, it's such an awesome topic to talk about. Who along your journey, who are the guys that have helped you get to this point? Man, uh, well, I, I, let me, I'll, I'll apologize first because I probably won't be able to mention everybody. Um, I've had so many mentors, still have plenty of mentors in my life um, that have helped me get to where, I, where I'm at. You know, I, starting, I mean, you start with my dad, you know, he was an amazing example of what it was like to just to, to be a dad, to be a great dad, to be there for me, uh, to put food on our table, to, to put us in an environment where we can thrive in many different facets of life. So I've always looked up to him, um, as a way to kind of measure how am I doing in terms of raising, you know, getting my family going, getting my career going and sustaining all this for, for the long term. In the fitness industry, mm -hmm. one of my, like, so from an education side, to be able to present on stage goes, as you know, beyond just, you know, regurgitating information, you need to make it an experience where it's engaging, it's entertaining, it's fun. One of the first guys that did that for me, who, who brought me up by, by his side was uh, by the guy named, by the name of Scott Pullen. Uh, he's now, he's a great friend of mine and I still consider him a mentor. Uh, he's, he's an amazing presenter. If you ever have a chance to see him just speak in front of a crowd, he just owns the crowd like a comedian and he's, he's full of knowledge. And, uh, he, he showed me a lot about the aspect of education that is often ignored, which is beyond the information that you give to somebody. It's the story and the journey that you, that you walk somebody through so that they actually take that information and it becomes ingrained. Um, also, I, I, you know, shout out to, to Rodney Korn, who is at NASM, who co-founded uh, PTA Global. He brought me under his wing for many years and he really helped me organize and make all this complexity that we've been learning around movement, he's helped me make it really simple. That's one of his gifts. Um, and I've been able to take a lot of that and, and be able to do it myself as well from a health coaching perspective. And so I've learned a ton from him uh, along the way. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, Anthony Carey brought me under his wing. I got to to train with him at his uh, facility called Function First. He's a He specializes in helping people um, get out of pain. It's oh, awesome. a lot of this behavior stuff that we're talking about. There's so much overlap there. And then not, so you combine somebody who really knows biomechanics with understanding human beings very well and how to engage them and to get them to perceive their reality a little bit differently, which is really necessary for somebody who's in chronic pain. 
um, he taught me an insane amount and, you know, I, he's like a big brother of mine. So he's, he's, he's definitely family. Uh, and, and Michelle Dalcourt, of course, he's been, uh, the biggest geek of them all just to, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I am, I, I absorb very little, but the cool thing is I get to see him so often that you, when you aggregate little bits of information over time, next thing you know, you kind of know a decent amount. And, uh, I think just through being, alongside him now for so long he's been just guiding me mentoring me through this process um and helping me uh just find kind of my seat on this uh on this bus that we're taking uh towards helping people find greater health in their life um he's been instrumental in that so that's that's a short list um but yeah, man, the, the, my recommendation would be the more people that you can surround yourself with, the better. And the more you can steal from everybody. And I use the term steal loosely uh, because ultimately everybody has something that's pretty amazing to provide. Even things that you don't really believe in a whole lot, there's still something of value there. You just got to look close and then you can take that and you can, ha- there's going to become a time where you're going to be able to pull that out while you're guiding somebody around this proverbial wall. Yeah, set the ego aside and just listen. That's a That's challenge a for a lot of people. You know, I, I, I had a I had, I had a big ego oh, myself yeah. back in the days. Um, I thought I knew everything, and you know, as you learn more, as you as you probably know, Cam, it's uh, you start to recognize you you know less and less as the years go by. Uh, which is, <laughs> but that's the that's oh, the fun part, right? right? That's to me, I think, was what continues to kindle our passion for wanting to help others and to want to want to continue to learn more. Um, is the fact that we'll never master us, right? Human beings, how we, how we, how we do, how we yep. function. We'll never master that in our lifetime. And I think that's the fun part. No, it definitely is the fun part. I mean, we've all been there. We've all had, uh, that moment where we were, th- we thought we were everything, you know, like we knew everything, you know, nobody could teach me a word or nobody could teach me anything else. And man, it's, uh, it's fun when you get rocked by, new knowledge and curiosity it is it's it sucks at first (laughs) it sucks at first but then but the gift at the end is magical absolutely there's nothing like having your your brain smattered on the wall and then you're looking back at your brains going that's my brains that's that's pretty amazing (laughs) totally so derico what is one principle in fitness that you know to be true of everything there's so much information out there but if there was one that you had to stick stand by which one do you know to be absolutely uh, true that variable movement promotes health i like that that's good could you elaborate a little <laughs> bit more on that give another hour no the <laughs> uh so the idea is, is this if our body thrives on the idea of variability from a biological perspective so uh, and from a physiological perspective, I should say. So if we look at, let's say, the tissues of your body, your connective tissues, all those, the tissue around your joints, if you feed those joints force at different angles, the body will fortify itself stronger to accommodate moving in variable ways. Our brain, mm-hmm. if you stimulate it in variable ways, we know can manifest into neurogenesis uh, and neuroplasticity. Right? You can create more brain cells and you can get more brain cells to fire with each other to create a more intelligent human being. From a gut health perspective, if you have a diet that is inherently variable, you will have a microbiome that is variable. And what, there's, what we're starting to learn now from people that study the gut and, and gut bacteria is that variable, a variable microbiome is healthy for uh, it's, it's necessary for gut health. Uh, if we look at your heart rate, we, we can measure uh, your readiness for exercise by looking at heart rate variability. If your heart rate is too rigid on a beat-to-beat basis, it shows that your system is not ready for exercise. So inherently, if your body has a heartbeat, or it should have a heartbeat, if your heart rate, if the, <laughs> if the heart rate and the heart beats on the beat-per-beat, a scale are variable that they're not always on like this this time uh you know lump 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 it's a sign of a healthy nervous system 
and perhaps a healthy heart. Uh, for looking at your muscular system, if you move in variable ways, we allow our musculature to develop by recruiting more motor units within a muscle. And we also get to synergize multiple muscle groups together to facilitate a, a greater movement ability. Your bone, your bone system, right? If you looked at your bone matrix, it's set up. If you open up, uh, the, the ends of the bone, you'll see it's very sponge-like and that's to sustain that bone density that we often look at. That bone density comes when not just with movement, but if you move in various angles, you can fortify a stronger bone. As a result, you'll create greater bone density. Um, so the list uh, for variability and how it augments health is huge. And so what I would challenge people to do is to break their paradigm of always moving in the same way all the time, because a lot of what fitness is now, it's a highly repetitious state of, of movement and sending force into the body in repetitious manners. And then that is, to me, not a sustainable platform for both performance or for health. You know, drop the mic on that one, DP. That Thank was you. awesome. Uh, I don't know what I said. What did I just say? <laughs> <laughs> no, you said that <laughs> variability is awesome there it is essentially all right man final question and i'm gonna let you go this has been incredible i'm so thankful for your time it is a hundred years from now and you're dead you come back as a ghost and you visit your tombstone what does it say man this is a deep question dude uh what does it say you know, I haven't even thought that far yet. I'm not even sure if I'll have a tombstone. <laughs> but if I did have a tombstone, what would it say? Uh, you know, I just hope it says something as simple as uh, loving husband, uh, loving father, and uh, just somebody who gave a shit about people around him. Oh, that's great. We got to care about those around us, man. Yeah, you know, with this, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the social media culture, and it's it's so self centered right now. It's it's, uh, it's just I don't know. I'm finding it kind of annoying. I don't want the human race to be more self centered. I want the opposite. I would love to see if all of us can be more giving to each other. I think we'd have a happier, healthier world as a result. So I'm gonna continue to strive for that, and I hope uh, I'm hoping I hope I can influence. Uh, others to, to seek the same gains that I'm looking for. Yeah. I mean, we're social beings and we thrive better when we help each other out. I mean, it, it gives us a greater sense of fulfillment and purpose when you can help somebody out who is in need or may not even be in need just to listen, talk, or, you know, go on a walk yes. with them, get That's some pancakes cool. or something. Yeah, let's do that next time I'm in LA. There we go. Or if I'm well, in San so Diego, man. Happy to take you to my favorite pancake spots. Yeah, there we go. Derek, where can people find you? Where's the best place to uh, reach out? Uh, yeah, the Institute of Motion, www.instituteofmotion.com. That is the best place to see kind of what we're doing, uh, what I'm doing on a day to day basis, uh, what we're involved in. So please uh, come check us out if you're interested in uh, the idea of health coaching and the, the promotion of self care. Uh, in one's daily life. That's basically what we do a lot of. So I'd love to, love to, to network with you and uh, get, to, get to know you that way. And just to be clear, even if people are not fitness professionals, I mean, you, would you recommend that just somebody in the general population come out and attend a course? You'd have to be a, uh, you'd be, you'd have to be a geek of, of, of the human, of, <laughs> of, of us, right. Of, of studying human beings. So, it, we are not going to like because we like totally. to geek out, right? We like to investigate why this might be a great approach to something, right? Um, so we geek out on mm -hmm. some of the science. So if you're if you're a geek of science, um, definitely. If you're an enthusiast of health and or fitness, definitely. Um, but if you just want, you know, straight up, here are some solutions. I think that's where you probably just want to hire a health coach. Awesome, Derek, man, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I don't know. Can't, yeah, can't, can't say, say enough. enough about you. I man. Appreciate it's it, an man. absolute honor and a pleasure to, uh, to engage with you in this opportunity, man. So thank you again. All right. No problem, man. Well, Derek, you take care you and have that. a great day, man. That's it for this week's episode of the principles of fitness. Everyone. I want to give Derek a special thanks for being with us on the show today. 
and sharing his knowledge and experience through the fitness industry and teaching us a little bit more about health coaching. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, share, leave a comment on iTunes, and stay tuned for the next episode of The Principles of Fitness.